Welcome to Backroom Talk. Well, topic for today's conversation, we're going to have a conversation around training splits and uh, creating smarter training splits. We teach three different ways of laying out splits. We teach full body resistance, upper lower splits, and uh, isolated. Absolutely. And now I don't want to assume that people know exactly what we mean by when we talk about a training split or even why we should use one. So could we spend a couple minutes just talking about like what the split actually is? We want to keep it as simple as possible. Um, I think we want to ensure that it's sustainable, the split that we're laying out allows for sustainability and resistance training to occur. To listen to more Backroom Talk, be sure to subscribe. Learn to design personalized programs with the OPEX system of coaching by heading to opexfit.com. Well, guys, welcome to another episode of Backroom Talk. I'm Georgia here with Carl. How are you doing today, Carl? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Um, it is a beautiful Wednesday. Um, it's the afternoon for me. It's probably six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning for you in Australia. Yeah, six thirty a.m. are uh, here for me on a Thursday because I'm in the future, which is pretty cool. Uh, How is that? How is it? How's the world tomorrow? You know, it's beautiful actually. It was raining yesterday, but today the sun is out, and I feel like I have to apologize to the people listening because. There are some very noisy magpies outside of my window that have been squawking. Uh, they're an Australian bird. And I guess they're just like going off right now because the sun is coming up. Uh, so if you guys hear like a weird noise, that's what's going on. They've quieted down. They're not as bad as they were two minutes ago. Yeah, I uh, hope that stays that way because uh, it was piercing my eardrums. <laughs> Well, topic for today's conversation, we're going to have a conversation around training splits and uh, creating smarter training splits. Are you excited for this one, Carl? Yeah, I'm super excited. I'm always excited to talk about training splits. Now, I'm going to pull back like a little bit of the mystery, which is recording podcasts and uh, let everyone know that we started to record this one yesterday, but then I uh, had some technical issues. So we're going for take two. And the reason I say that is um, naturally when we were recording it the first time, I said smarter training splits. And you said to me, I think we should rephrase that to simpler training splits, which I think is a really great way to uh, begin this conversation, that distinguishment between what is a smarter training split and what is a simpler training split and why do we care? Why do we think simpler is the way to go? So why did you bring that up, Carl? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I think we, I think we bring things up like this as we uh, battle this in our own practices, right? Or we experience it ourselves. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's just always something that's been, um, well, I shouldn't say always, it was something that used to kind of irk me a little bit where I always thought that I was kind of recreating the same wheel over and over and over um, instead of just like having a system where I can kind of just pull uh, different splits out of a, out of a hat, if that makes sense. Um, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like sitting down and writing the exact same training program from scratch every time. That's how I kind of felt like building training splits turned into, because to be honest, and I'm kind of guessing here, but to be honest, it's probably like, it's probably like 20 to 25 training splits that most people use, um, like variations of, of, uh, three that we're going to talk about. Um, but it's just like, why don't we just have those as like best practices and kind of just pull from those and, uh, uh, put what's needed inside of those in terms of exercise selection and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, what, what, what we're trying to solve here is, uh, kind of having a conversation on how to, how to simplify the process. Um, and I would talk about system, systemizing things a lot and, and all of that. And it's like, this isn't any different. Uh, so it'd be nice to be able to systematize building out our training splits. Absolutely. And I know when I think about like, what does it mean to have a smarter or a better or whatever you want to call it training split? Like the thing that comes to mind is it gets people results, right? Like at the end of the day, the client doesn't really care if you spent two minutes or two hours designing that training split. What they care about is, are they getting results from the training that they're doing? Are they enjoying the process? All of these things. Uh, and if you have some kind of a system and a simple framework to be able to follow when it 
comes to putting together a training split that then frees up time that you can spend on the other elements of coaching that may actually be more important to the client, like sending him a message or checking in with them, uh, more time on communication, sending him a little Loom video inside of Coach RX. So I think getting away from this idea that we have to spend a lot of time on something for it to be effective and it has to be highly complex in order to be effective uh, or good is really, really important. And certainly there is a time and a place for complexity. And sometimes we do want to go deep and get creative and reinvent the wheel. So we're keeping ourselves on our toes. But uh, again, with something as ultimately simple as a training split, that is just the starting point for that design. Why would you want to sit down and spend 90 minutes every time you design one at the beginning of a new cycle? Yeah, definitely. And, and what we're working on right now is building a framework to developing training splits, right? So I think uh, I think it's fun to get creative inside of a framework, but if we're getting creative kind of uh, uh, outside of any kind of framework or principles, like it just it gets really challenging because you don't know you don't know where your barrier should be, right? Um, and you end up spending thirty minutes on something that you look back at and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna kind of trash this because this makes no sense. And you just go back to what you know. So um, yeah, I I do think there's a percentage of coaches that really thrive and, and uh, let's just say have a, a really good time in, in being in that creative space and kind of like messing around with this and t- tinkering with that. Um, but there's a larger percentage of coaches that don't like to do that. There's coaches that are just like, I just want a framework. I want to slap that on my clients and I want to think about and spend time on the things that I think are more important, right? Like the things that you said, like communication with the client, uh, things like that, right? not saying that that's every coach and, and those things should be most important. Cause I think uh, we've all kind of gone through phases of like being really creative and wanting to, you know, push your limits and like stretch your brain and all of that and designing training programs and training splits. But uh, I think it's just nice to have a framework to sit inside of and be like, Hey, I know I'm giving the right thing. Um, I can either get creative in my exercise design, or I can uh, spend a little bit more time doing other things outside of program design. Absolutely. And now I don't want to assume that people know exactly what we mean by when we talk about a training split or even why we should use one. So could we spend a couple minutes just talking about like what the split actually is, where it sits inside of that coaching process, and then just kind of jam on why we think it's important? Yeah. So we just call it planning, right? So uh, we have long-term planning and short-term planning. So long-term planning, we're looking at the big picture. Um, You know, what is the next three years, two years, one year look like? Uh, And what's inside of that? What type of fitness are we going to be doing? What type of phases are we going to be doing? What are the goals of that long-term plan? And then we kind of magnify in a little bit. And then we talk about short-term plans. And in those short-term plans, we're basically taking chunks out of that long-term plan and getting more specific. So we look at two things in short-term plans. We look at uh, what does it look like week to week, right? Like we're thinking, what does progression look like week to week? What are we doing? What are the goals and the outcomes that we want to occur in this specific short-term plan? So the short-term plan might be four, six, eight weeks. Um, So it's like, what are the goals? What are the outcomes that we want to get to? And then more specifically, and this is what we're talking about with building splits, what are we doing day by day? So we have seven days in the week. What am I doing on each one of those days? What am I doing in resistance? What am I doing in aerobics? Uh, Are we just having an outdoor day? Are we having a complete rest day? So it's just getting more specific there. And then in terms of the importance on those, it, it, it kind of, uh, it acts as that, I'll say it again, that framework to now design within. So when we're uh, going week to week, we don't have to rethink, uh, rethink what we're doing with this client or with yourself, right? It's like, oh, I planned two weeks ago that Monday was going to be da, 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 da. So I'm going to be doing that, da, 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 da. And I'm going to be progressing that over these eight weeks. I know that Tuesday is going to be that I'm going to progress that over these eight weeks. So it kind of just uh, aligns our brains in terms of uh, what are we doing over this period of time? Yeah. And just like to reiterate there, it's a step before design. So when you're laying out that split, you're not making the decision that you're doing, you know, back squats and skull crushes and ring push-ups. you're making the decision on the patterns that are going to go inside of a training day and maybe some of the characteristics connected to those patterns, but we're just going to keep it really simple and uh, focus on patterns for the sake of this conversation. So I love that. And I love the like 
pattern-based approach to resistance program design that we use inside of the OPEX method because, and again, I'll use that word framework, it provides a parameter that you can be creative inside of because I think a lot of coaches, uh, especially newer coaches, will rush to thinking about exercises. Okay, I'm programming front squats on this day and I'm programming bench press on this day. And then they get very stuck in this like one track mind and don't really think about like how does this pattern or how does this exercise connect to the movement pattern that I'm trying to train? How does that movement pattern connect to functional living and great movement and uh, really be able to connect with a client on why that one exercise is beneficial? So when we take that step of patterns first, number one, we then have like a zillion options inside of that pattern for the actual exercise prescription. And it may or may not be important what actual exercise you use for that client based on what they need and how specific you are. So there is a little bit more room for variation and uh, we'll, we'll say it again, creativity when you take that pattern-based approach. But I think it also just connects better for the client, right? when you're able to explain to them what the six movement patterns are, why they're doing them. And when they open up their coach RX and they look at the training for the day and they see that they're working on the squat and the bend pattern. And they understand that squatting is something that they're doing because they want to be able to get up off a chair when they're 80 years old. And they understand that they're doing bending because they want to be able to bend down and tie their shoelaces without throwing out their back. So it's just a nice way to bring in that like narrative of why am I doing what I'm doing to that training session on a daily basis for the client too. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, you hit it there. Uh, in our approach, we use patterns, right? Like we're not saying, and those, those patterns are squat, lunge, bend, push, pull, core. Uh, we're not saying back, biceps, chest, quads, hamstrings, right? Like we're, we're not doing that. Um, and our approach, that's what we use. We, we use patterns. And I think it's important to talk about why we use patterns and why we don't use uh, specific parts. And the reason is it has to be outcomes, right? Uh, we have a belief, right? Like we have a belief in um, why people should do fitness, right? People should do fitness because they can do it. People should do fitness because it needs to connect to what they want to do uh, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now. Um, we're not saying this is the best approach to use if you want to step on stage and compete in bodybuilding, right? It's like, I wouldn't use a pattern brace, a, a pattern based approach if I was training to be a bodybuilder. I wouldn't. I use a parts based approach, right? Because I'm being judged based on how big my biceps are and how, how that, uh, how that last spread looks right when I turn around. Um, so I think that's really important, right? Um, so that's, that's why we're, that's why we lead with this pattern based approach and that's why we use it. And you can get, you can get into the minutia there inside of, you know, okay, what, what's inside of a squat, what's inside of a lunge, uh, what's inside of a bend, um, are we doing vertical or horizontal pushing and pulling? Are we doing elbow flexion Are we doing elbow extension, right? Like you can get into the minutia there. But uh, for sakes of this conversation, let's just challenge each other and, and people listening, just think of the pattern itself and think of the thousands of movements that can be inside of that pattern. But the goal is just to do the pattern. And Georgia, you mentioned, you know, people are able to get up off of couches or off of a toilet, right? It's just like, we're choosing these patterns because these are the patterns that we use in daily life. We're not saying that you need to uh, progress to get off the toilet more efficiently or better. Like that's, that's not what we're saying. We're just saying you're doing it right. So because we're doing these patterns on a day-to-day -day basis, let's, uh, let's have these lead the, the intention in what we're doing in, in exercise. Absolutely. So we've got our lower body patterns, our squat and our bend and our lunge, our upper body patterns, our push and our pull. And then we've got core and inside of core, we could have rotation. We could have calories. There's a ton of different uh, core activities that go inside of that pattern. Again, when we began this conversation yesterday, Carl, you, you gave an interesting caveat on the core piece and whether or not that always fits into a split. Like, are you always programming core for your clients or not? Yeah, core is an interesting one. Uh, core is a prerequisite to all of the other patterns. So when I do any squat movement, I'm using my core. When I do any push movement, I'm using my core. I think the example I used yesterday was uh, like a single leg RDL, right? Like, what am I using? I'm, I'm using all of my anti-rotation muscles. What are my anti-rotation muscles? Those are, the, that's my core, right? I'm using that. And I would actually argue that I'm using uh, those, those muscles a lot. 
those, those muscles are contracting a lot harder than as if I were doing like a hanging oblique raise or a core specific exercise. Uh, when I lay down to do a dumbbell bench press, I'm using my core. Um, funny story. I got my appendix taken out probably 10 years ago. And, um, I was just kind of a weirdo back then where I like just had, I was just addicted to exercise and just like had to exercise. So it was like three days after getting my appendix removed and, uh, the doctor or the surgeon was like, Oh, you need to take, I think it was something crazy, like six weeks off of, uh, any resistance training or anything like that. And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, so I was in the gym like three days later and I was like, okay, I'm going to, and I had to like organize my brain around doing like non-core intensive exercises. And it was a, and I knew this, right. But I was like, ah, I can, I can probably kind of like stay lax in the midline. And I realized really quickly, there was no exercise in the gym that I can do, uh, that didn't utilize my core, even a leg extension, a seated leg extension on a machine. Like I was actually bracing down and using my core. So my ass didn't lift off of the, uh, the seat there. Right. So, um, we're definitely using our core, whatever we're doing. Um, so sorry, that was really long and drawn out, but the point that I was getting to was because the core is a prerequisite. If someone has an adequate amount of core strength or stability or endurance, then I would argue that you actually don't have to train it specifically in, in their split. Like you don't have to say I'm doing core, um, because we're, like I said, we're doing it and all of those other exercises. And unless there's a reason that we want to get really good at that, at that pattern, it's like, yeah, you, you have that prerequisite down. You're probably okay. Uh, and we test that in OPEX move, right? So thought experiment for CCP coaches, maybe don't train the core specifically. If someone passes the core assessment with flying colors, if they don't, then what do we always say? Just feed the problem, right? So, uh, they fail that assessment, just train that assessment, right? Do some core work, do some other things that you think might help out with that assessment, um, or come up with your own assessment, right? That's just one of thousands of assessments that you can use for the core. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, kind of where we're sitting with the core. It's like, you don't, you don't need, you don't need to use it. And uh, a good thought, ex another good thought experiment. Uh, we discussed it on a, uh, Jim's education call is think about, uh, the peak maximal contraction for every pattern, right? Like think of what that is for the squat right? Like we're probably picturing that in our, in our minds right now, it's something like a back squat, right? What is that for a lunge? We're thinking about that. It's probably not a walking lunge because there's too much involved, right? It's probably like a reverse lunge with a lot of load on our back, right? What is that for a bend? Very obvious. It's probably a deadlift for a push again, very obvious, probably a strict press, but I would argue it's probably a bench press over because we're going to be able to lift a little bit more load there for a pull. It's probably a weighted pull up. Or for some people, it's just the pull up for the core. What is it? Ooh, yeah, probably a squat or a deadlift or reverse lunge. You know, you see where I'm getting there. So, um, yeah, the core it's, a, it's prerequisite. Uh, so if someone has it, they don't need to crush a bunch of core in their training program. Even if they say, I want to get a, a six pack abs, they could probably get that, uh, in other ways. Yeah, probably, uh, more of a nutrition tweak that needs to happen, uh, there for those six pack abs. So we've got our uh, reasons why we have a split in place uh, based on patterns. One more piece I'll add there, and you kind of spoke to it already, just that notion of progression, right? Uh, if we want to progress something, we have to have some kind of a framework in place. And yeah, if someone's just doing fitness, you can have them do something random every single day and uh, maybe they're going to be okay. But best practice, we would say, is to have some sort of a structure in place through that split. Uh, for you as a coach, it's going to help you stay organized from week to week. So you don't get into week seven of an eight week uh, training progression and be like, what was I actually doing? Like, why was I doing this on this day? It's really easy in week one to like, you could sit down and write out a split and just put the exercises into practice and know why you did each thing on each day without actually writing that split. But you're not going to remember that when you get six weeks in. So ensuring you've actually taken the time to have that split written out before exercise program design is going to keep you on track and have a reference point for you. I'd argue as well for like the majority of busy clients. Yes. Some people like variation in program design. Yes. You run into that person. That's like, I never want to do the same thing on the same day ever. That's a whole different conversation, but I think most people like consistency in life. 
and in training. And if we can get them to understand the benefit of, uh, you know, coming into the gym and doing aerobic work on a Thursday and why that fits in really nicely with the rhythm that they have in their life. Uh, I think most people enjoy knowing what they're going to be expecting one week from the next to the next, being able to plan their day around that. uh, And just knowing again, that there's going to be some consistency and why behind their training. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Cause that was, that was actually the first thing that came to my mind as you were starting that starting down that road. It was just like, yeah, rhythm and consistency is why I would want to split uh, myself. Right. Like that's why I do always follow those splits. Cause I love that rhythm and consistency and I love playing with it. And something else that's quite interesting as well. Uh, we didn't really get into it, but we talked about like the, the, the outcomes that we're looking for with a pattern based approach. We also have to look at Uh, what outcomes we're looking for when we talk about progression and what does progression look like week to week? Very very tough one. It's a very, very tough one uh, because it's, and we teach this, right? It's like volume to intensity or we're adding, we're adding volume over time or we're doing this or we're doing that. But it's like, at the end of the day, if, if, uh, if that outcome is just, you know, to build some consistency and fitness to do it on a week to week basis, to feel good while we're doing it and to always feel like we're capable when we do do it. I said, do, do, sorry. Uh, (laughs) when we perform it, um, what is the importance of progression really? Right. And I don't have the answer to that. I'm kind of just like bringing that up because that kind of came to mind as you were going through that progression conversation. Like what, what do you think the benefit of progression is, or do you, do you look at it that way, Georgia? Yeah, well, it depends on the client, right? Like, are they just training for life and to let's, uh, Yeah, yeah. Let's not even, let's just say generally. I know that's yeah. tough, right? But let's say like general, because pro- we, we try to teach it, right? Like general progression principles, right? So let's not even, let's, let's try to not look at what the client's goal is or where they're at. Let's just say like, ideally, let's say they're capable of doing everything and they just want to do fitness. That's their goal. They're like, I want to do fitness. Like where do you sit on progression? So I think like progression is a weird one, right? Because we're never truly progressing as much as we think we are in that it's never as controlled as we think it might be when we sit down to write our programming coach RX. There's so many variables that go into, you know, uh, let's say we have this idea that we're going to be progressing load from week to week. And that's what we're doing. We're following this linear progression. Well, what if someone just like changed their grip on the bar a little bit or the angle that they were pushing at, or uh, they stood with a slightly different stance? Like it's going to change the way that that load is being produced. Uh, and it's not going to be as simple as, okay, they went up 10 pounds on the bar every week the way that they chose to engage or not engage that muscle. Like, were they doing a bicep curl and just swinging their arms versus were they actually contracting uh, that muscle deliberately? All of those things are going to affect like this notion that we have of progression. Same thing on aerobic work, right? Like, is someone actually like doing more work from week to week or did they just game it a little bit better? Like, did they improve aerobic capacity or did they just change their strategy a little bit? So I just don't think progression is black and white as we think it is. What I do think is important connected to progression is like consistent exposure to something. So yeah, we want people to get exposure to all patterns of movement. We want people to be exposed to breathing uh, through map work. And the only way we can do that is having like some kind of structure connected to that. Otherwise, if we just say you're doing random stuff, they might go six weeks without never doing a squat pattern. So if we have a split in place with progression in mind, it might not be as simple as we're linearly progressing this like one pattern or this one piece of aerobic work, but at least we are dosing them to that pattern or that aerobic work on a week by week consistent basis so that we know they're, again, for lack of a better word, being exposed to it. Yeah. Nicely put. I was just wondering kind of well, where, what where your head was on that. Like, do you, what do you, what do you think that? <sighs> um, yeah. I mean, breaking my own rule, I do have to go back and say that, yes, you had a point when you said uh, it does depend on, you know, what outcome we're getting to. Um, but going back to the, the, uh, the picture that I painted where it was like the person's goal is just to do fitness. And honestly, I think that's, uh, that's a lot of people's goal or, 
if that was a lot of people's goal, they would actually be able to get to their, whatever they think their goal is, if that makes sense. Um, if people just move more often and, and, uh, did it more, um, did it more naturally isn't the right word, but, uh, intuitively, I guess I would say, um, but if I were to follow the same parameters, I think, I think progression is very overrated. Um, the idea of progressing and having to have like your finger on the pulse and, and how someone is progressing. And again, I'm not saying this for like a competitive fitness athlete. I'm not saying this for someone that needs to specifically get a lot better at something that they can get better at in the gym. Yes, obviously power lifters keep progressing your bench squat and deadlift. Don't just go do patterns every day and hope that it improves. I get that. But if intentions are not to improve the bench squat or deadlift or do 30 muscle ups for time faster, um, I'm with you, like just expose yourself or your client to all patterns of movement as frequently as you can recover from them. Right. Like that's a, that's, I think that's a pretty good model for most people. Um, but I think the, uh, as frequently as you can recover from them is something that we all have to keep in mind, uh, because, uh, more is more is not always better. And, you know, we, we don't only perform patterns in resistance training, right? Like you'll get someone that lays out a beautiful split where they're like, I'm doing this for resistance. Then I'm doing this for aerobics and I'm doing this for resistance. Then I'm doing this for aerobics. And then I'm going out for a 10 mile hike. And then I'm doing this. I'm doing and they get like three weeks into that design and they're just like, I, I, I hate fitness. I can't, I feel like crap when I'm doing all of this. It's like, yeah, you might just be doing a little bit too much. Right. Uh, but if we could intuitively look at, oh, I feel like crap when I'm doing this and then simply go into our coach RX and be like minus one on the uh, volume score across the entire board. And then they're like, oh, I feel great now. And it's like, that was just really intuitive. There was nothing in there that had to do with volume and intensity and shifts and, you know, tonnage and, and, uh, time under tension and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I think, I think progression is quite overrated for, uh, general population people that don't need to progress for something specifically in the gym. For sure. To like, just hit on this for a little bit longer to play devil's advocate against myself a little bit here. It's like, well, <clears throat> some people really enjoy progression. It keeps them consistent with exercise. They, get this like positive feedback loop where they see that they are improving, uh, you know, five pounds on their bench press from week to week. And they feel really good about that. Or they can do one more pull up than they did the week before. And that keeps them coming back and keeps them inspired and wanting to train. So maybe there is a benefit of progression by virtue of keeping that person connected to what they're doing, feeling results. And then I'd argue against that a little bit and be like, could we talk to that person about some of the other benefits of exercise that aren't connected to these like performance metrics? Is there other things that they should be appreciating and enjoying and feeling through training? Um, you know, just the ability to be consistent, how something feels from one week to the next, uh, the, you know, byproduct of like having stronger grip from the pull-ups and then going to Brazilian jiu-jitsu and like performing better on the mat. Like, is there other pieces that we could bring out other than just like this notion of progression based on performance metrics that might actually be better for that person. So I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Extending it a little longer. I think there are. Um, but I also think you could still get to those progression outcomes without thinking with the progression mindset. So when I, when I said, I think progression is overrated, I didn't mean like doing pull-ups on Tuesday for four weeks, like you shouldn't do that. I, I didn't mean that. I just meant like, uh, kind of going back to what you said, where it's like, there's a lot of variables that we just don't understand. Right. Like, I don't care how smart you are. There's things for that person that you're working with that you don't understand. That's help that's happening physiologically. So how many times have you worked with someone and just by them doing movement for an amount of time, they just like got better at everything. So there was still the opportunity to look at like those, the, those fitness monitoring pieces and, you know, you're like, okay, we've been, uh, pulling vertically for six weeks. Let's go back and see how many, uh, strict pull-ups you can do now. And they're like, I could only do three, six weeks ago. And now I can do six. Did you just give me like a magic program? And you're like, uh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> like I just had you doing some vertical pulling. Right. So that's all I meant is like, getting really nerdy about progression, I think is, is overrated for general population people and trying to control 
every percentage point and trying to control how much load they increase by or how many reps they increase by um, week to week. But like you said, some people kind of need that, right? Like they're, they're like, Ooh, I, I, I enjoy seeing those, those increases week to week. So I do think we have to consider the individual definitely. Um, but just because we're implementing what they want, doesn't mean that that's getting them more better. <laughs> I know that's, that's, that's improper English, but more better than if you were just to give them uh, a vertical pulling pattern on a week to week basis. Yeah. It's checking ourselves as coaches, right. And reminding ourselves that like, there are things that we can't control and that we don't know. And even if we think, like you said, we've got this perfect program, perfect progression laid out. Oh, we're so smart. Like they're going to be able to do this many pull-ups by week 10. There's so many other things that could affect that positively or negatively that we didn't actually intend to. So uh, just making sure we keep our uh, expectations and egos in line, I think. Yeah, definitely. And then as we kind of get into this split conversation specifically, um, if you're a coach that's working with people, ask people uh, what they enjoy on a week by week or cycle by cycle basis. Because uh, I've worked with people that never wanted anything to change. They're just like, Monday is this and it will be this forever, right? Like, I don't want to do upper and lower. I want to do full body resistance every Monday, right? Like, don't ever change that. I don't care where you say I am in training age or whatever. I just really enjoy that. Right. So if someone says that to you, it's, it's clear that they've thought about it. Right. And they uh, they have some conviction behind that. So it's like, yep, you were doing full body resistance on Mondays. Cool. Let me, let me play with that. And then you'll have some people that are just like, I appreciate this progression thing and kind of sticking to it and building rhythm, but I just want to change up every now and again. So for that person, it might be every like six weeks, you're kind of changing up what their split looks like. Um, so I would start there and just, uh, you know, understand what what's going to keep your clients engaged right um engaged and uh consistent and compliant um yeah so i think that's important just to chat with your clients on some of that stuff absolutely and i mean this that answers a little bit of the question i'm going to ask you next carl but like what is before we get to actually laying out the split what are some of the pieces and information and questions you need to ask to get the information you need about that client so that you can lay out that split. Yeah, definitely. So the, the most obvious one for a lot of our coaches, for sure, is just understanding where they are, right? Understanding their training ages, understanding their capabilities or not, um, understanding what's going to be inside of that broadly by just understanding those things first, then understanding how many days a week. So we're just going to talk about resistance splits today. So understanding how many days per week they're going to train resistance, right? So are they going to train one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven days per week? I'm going to put it out there that I think it's definitely best practice that just about everyone trains resistance three times a week, right? Like I think uh, once is not enough just because you're not, there's not enough frequency there. Um, and six times is just a little bit too much. Um, so I think that sweet spot for most people is around three days of resistance training. And then understanding, you know, what, what other things are they going to be doing outside of resistance training? Uh, what does that relationship with aerobic work look like? Are they going to be doing aerobic work? How many days a week are they going to be doing aerobic work? Um, and what else they have going on in life, right? If you're working with a construction worker and they want to do resistance training three times a week, there's some other variables that you have to think about that working with a, a desk jockey, uh, you don't have to think about, right? Like you and I. Um, so yeah, yeah. So those, those, that's where I would start is just understanding training ages, uh, capabilities, and uh, what else you're going to be doing as well as how many days per week they're going to be training resistance. Yeah. You'll, I found as well, like a lot of times people will have more time to train on certain days versus others, or they know they've got like, and this connects to the construction worker versus desk jockey piece you just hinted at there, Carl, but like they know they have a really, you know, jam-packed day of meetings on a Thursday, but they still want to train on a Thursday. It still works for them, but they just can't do as much as they might be able to do on a Friday. So just knowing the time windows people have to train, uh, the kind of energy, what mindset they're going to be in from day to day to day. Like some people might do really well training on weekdays. Other people might do well training on the weekends where they don't have the stress of like being at work. So schedule and just understanding what's going on in people's lives, uh, I think is really important too. Yeah, that's a good point. I've, I've messed around a lot with uh, people with busy Monday through Fridays 
um, not giving resistance training on Monday or Friday. Um, and that's worked a lot. That's, that's helped a lot with them because they're just like, Monday is my most jam packed day. Cognitively, it's just very taxing. And by the time I get to, to the gym or, or wherever I'm going, I just don't feel like I really have it right. Like I could do some easy flow aerobic work. Um, but I can't just get into to resistance training on that day. And then on Friday, uh, end of a busy week, uh, kind of coming down from, you know, all of the meetings and all of this and all of that. So kind of the same case. So um, aerobics are off days on Mondays and Fridays for like busy Monday to Fridayers has worked really well. Yeah. Okay. So we've got the information we need for that client. Uh, we've laid out their long-term plan. We've laid out their short-term plan inside of that. Now we're actually sitting down to write that daily split. So what does that process look like? Like, how do you decide what's going into each day? Um, and what, what are you writing? Yeah, definitely. So uh, what we teach is we teach three different ways of laying out splits. We teach full body resistance, upper lower splits, and uh, isolated or specific splits. So full body resistance, that's essentially you're doing upper and lower body every day that you do resistance training. Um, we have upper and lower splits where you're doing upper one day, lower another day. That one gets a little bit weird because if you have someone that's training an odd day, um, like they're training three or five days a week in resistance. Um, what do you do on that third and that fifth day? We'll talk about that when we get there, but, uh, that one gets a little bit weird, the upper and lower split. Um, and then we also have the specific, which also gets a little bit weird because if someone's not training, you know, five, six times a week, um, it's tough to hit every pattern on every day, but a specific split is, Hey, I'm, I'm going to train the push pattern on Monday. I'm going to train the pull pattern on Wednesday. I'm going to train the squat pattern on Saturday, so on and so forth. So first I would start with, uh, what are we doing? Full body resistance, upper, lower, or an ISO split. Um, we attach that to training age a lot, right? Like our beginners were doing full body resistance. Uh, we also go back to full body resistance for our more advanced clients as well. Uh, intermediates we're doing upper, lower splits, and then advances or specific splits or ISO splits are just reserved for those advanced clients. And let's maybe talk about why we would, we would go beginner, intermediate, advanced on those, on those three. So, uh, a beginner client, what do they need? They just need a lot of touches on patterns, right? Like they need to learn or they need to develop motor control in every one of those patterns. So full body resistance is the best option there because you give them an opportunity to do, uh, almost all, almost all, uh, patterns on every single day that they're doing resistance. Um, the upper lower split. Now you're, moving into that intermediate stage. Uh, now you can really, you know, express the upper body, express the lower body. So as we start to kind of dabble with, you know, intensification or just like heavier loads, um, it's, it's tough to go from, you know, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, D1, D2, hitting everything with tougher loads, upper and lower body. So it just makes a lot of sense to kind of focus on, okay, upper body this day, lower body the next day, uh, because now we can actually recover from that work. Cause if we're going full body and tough, uh, contractions on each one of those days, uh, a lot of people are going to get burnt out and they're not going to be able to recover from that stuff. And then finally with the specific, it's like, now I'm at my maximal level of expressions. Like I can really express the push pattern. So I'm going to build an entire day around that push pattern and then so on and so forth for every pattern after that. So the first thing I would determine is what kind of split am I doing? Full body resistance, upper, lower, or an ISO split? So you've laid out like deciding that split based on training age, but that wouldn't be the only factor that caused you to decide what split you're going to use. Like full body resistance, you could use that for someone at any stage uh, in their development, whether they're a beginner, intermediate, advanced, or beyond. Uh, and the decision might be based on schedule, right? Like if someone can only train two days per week and they're intermediate, do you just want them to do one upper day and then one lower day and then not hit upper patterns for a full, you know, six days before they get back to that next week of training? probably not. Like it might be more appropriate to give them a full body split so that they get some more regular touches on those, uh, on those upper and lower patterns. Yeah, definitely. So the, the framework, I guess, to consider here is, um, you first decide where your client is in training age. And it's almost like 
if they're a beginner, we know that we're just going to do full body resistance, no matter how many, no matter how many days a week they can train, right? If they're uh, a beginner and they can train four days a week, you're not going to the upper lower split. You're just doing full body resistance for four days, but then you get an intermediate coming in, or you have a client that graduates to an intermediate. Now you can say, okay, I can do full body resistance with this person, or I can do an upper lower split. So um, yeah, good point there. So just to be clear on it, just because you are there in training age, doesn't mean you have to do it. Uh, but there are some prerequisites or there should be some prerequisites. Um, we, we don't want to take a beginner that, that trains five days a week and go push, pull, lunge, bend, you know, and it, like, we don't want to lay that out and do an ISO split with that person, uh, because frequency isn't going to be there for them. For sure. And they're just like, like, let's say it's a squat day for a beginner, right? Like, are they actually going to be able to do four different squatting exercises and get anything from that after they've done, you know, their first set of goblet squats, like they're probably going to be so fatigued. We know with beginners, what we're trying to improve is motor control in that pattern. So is giving them a ton of volume in the squat pattern or a ton of intensity in the squat pattern going to help with that goal of motor control. No, like once they hit the point where there's like breakdown of uh, mechanics and they're no longer performing that squat efficiently, we need to shut it down. And that's going to happen once they get past their A, most likely. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we've made the decision as to what split we're going to use. What happens next? Yeah, so now we plug in patterns. It's like, what what patterns are we going to do on, on what day? Um, and this gets a little, uh, this can get a little bit complex when we start to think about how many days per week, uh, this, this person is training, right? So, um, just starting with full body resistance, uh, I guess, I guess what I would go through the, uh, the practice that I would go through is first, I would determine what is my bias for this, this, this training program or this split. Um, so if you're, if your bias is balance, now you have that as like a framework in your brain, when you go and create the split, keep thinking about balance, balance, balance. So anytime you're doing a squat pattern, mark that as one. Anytime you're doing a bend pattern, mark that as one. By the time you get to Sunday, just add up how many times you're doing those patterns throughout the week. And if you see that you're doing the squat pattern two times and you're doing the bend pattern four times, uh, you're going against what your you said your bias was, which was ba uh, balance, right? So first I would think about what is my bias in this split um, so let's just, let's say it is, it is, it is balance, right? Now we have to look at, okay, we have this, this bias. Now, how many days per week do we have an opportunity to hit these patterns? So I said, best practice is three, right? So if you're doing full body resistance and you're training three days per week, that's very easy, right? I would actually say just train every pattern on every day, right? Core is going to be in there if they need to perform core. If they don't per need to perform core, then you could just leave it out, right? Like if that's not a, if they didn't pass that prerequisite um, in, in your movement screen, then go ahead and throw core in there. But if they did, it's like, okay, uh, you're squatting, you're lunging, you're bending, you're pushing, and you're pulling every single day. So let's, let's just imagine that we do want to add core in. Uh, and I, I love the six patterns. Cause it makes it really easy to go like a one, a two, B one, B two, you know what I mean? So on and so forth. It gets a little weird when we're like, ah, oh, we have five patterns we need to hit. Is that, is the first one not going to be a superset or is the last one not going to be a superset? Um, that's for you guys to solve. Um, but examples of uh, day one, right? So let's say day one is, so this is full body resistance. Day one is squat. So we're going, we're supersetting the squat and the pull pattern. Okay. Then we're supersetting the bend and the push pattern. And then we're ending it by supersetting the lunge and the core pattern, right? So I just set a bunch of patterns. Now we can start thinking about it as coaches in our brains. When we say a bunch of patterns or when we plug these into Coach RX, what type of things are we going to be doing? And remember what we said at the top, we're not going to break this down into like uh, horizontal and vertical and all that for purposes of this conversation. We're just doing the patterns, but you can start to think about, um, are we going, uh, like, are we biasing compound pattern movements in those patterns on certain days? Uh, if you are, those are probably going to be front loaded, right? So in this instance, I am biasing those, those compound movements as my A series. So the squat and the 
pull pattern would be those compound movements and then the rest would be non-compound so compound just think you know we're doing the back squat and we're doing the weighted pull up and then for everything else we're doing non-compound movements day two we're coming in we're doing the same patterns but just kind of notice the the difference in the ordering so day two we're coming in we're doing the the lunge and we're doing the push pattern so those are my compounds for the day and then we're doing squat we're pulling we're doing the bend and we're doing the core pattern day three we're starting off with the bend pattern and the push pattern so those are going to be my compounds for the day and then we're going to go into lunge, pull, squat, and core. So we're doing every pattern on every day, but the difference in this three-day split is we're identifying which ones are going to be compound movements. And you can kind of see, uh, well, maybe you didn't, but you kind of see there's best practices or here there's best practices and patterns that we pair together, right? So if I'm doing full body resistance, best practice, I pair upper and lower patterns together. So all of those patterns were either upper and lower or upper or lower with core. Also, just think about the types of movements that will eventually go into those patterns. Uh, Cause you're also thinking about that when you're putting a split together. When we think of bend, we think of uh, most likely holding something in our hands, right? Like we can do hip thrusts and, and, uh, and hamstring curls and all that stuff. But uh, when we think of compound movements, we're thinking of I'm holding a barbell or I'm holding heavy dumbbells or kettlebells in my hands. And when we think of a pull pattern, we think about hanging, right? We think about hanging or we think about needing grip strength to pull something to our center of mass. So those are very grip intensive. So best practice, let's try to stay away from pairing bend and pull patterns together because then the limiter is going to be grip and it's not going to be the back if you're pulling or it's not going to be the posterior chain if you're uh, picking something up off the ground. So that was kind of a lot, but those things need to be going through our heads as we're putting these splits together, right? Like you need to have the foresight to think about, okay, right now I'm putting these splits together. What is it going to look like in practice? Because I know everyone that's listening to this, that's ever written a program has put together a split and then you go and you put the exercises in, you're like, Ugh, and then you go and change your split because you're like, okay, that actually didn't work because we didn't have the foresight and that's okay. But we remember that and we're like, okay, next time I write this split, I need to think about that, right? Like the bend and the pull thing. Um, so that's just an example of putting the, together a full body resistance training program that's three days per week. That was great. And one thing, Carl, uh, like little pro tip from you that I've definitely taken into my own coaching practice when it comes to knowing which exercises are going to be compound and which ones are going to be more isolated activities is just using uppercase and lowercase to distinguish that. So like for your compounds, if you're doing a bend and a push as your compounds, capital B, capital P, if you're doing a squat and a pull as your like uh, isolated or accessory work, popping them uh, as lowercase. So lowercase S, lowercase P, uh, just to keep you organized in your designing. Yeah. And when I, when I figured that one out, I think I was, I was, uh, I found myself going back to the split and thinking like, Oh, what did I intend on doing here? So I always try to like, find, I always try to find like little areas where I'm like, okay, what can I do to like nudge myself? So I don't have to think. <laughs> and that was one of those where it was just like, okay, yeah, I'll just capitalize the the beginning letter. And I'll know when I see that, that I intended to do a compound movement there instead of writing the Cause what I used to do was I'd like write the pattern. I'd write the muscle and I would like have parentheses and then have like more specificity in there. And that just doesn't fit nicely. Right. in like a calendar view, like in coach RX or something. So just coming up with uh, little nudges to be like, okay, this is what I meant to do, or this is what I intend to do. Yeah. It's faster as well. Like I've been taking the time to like write out like a C or an I for compound or isolated, just deciding to capitalize or not is faster in your practice, which is what you want as a coach. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So you laid out full body. Do you want to now lay out upper lower and what that could look like? Yeah, let's, uh, and we, we won't go through it the same way that we went through that as specific, but um, let's go through like an idea or thought experiment. If someone has more than three days per week and they're doing full body resistance, um, I would go through the same process, right? So for example, if someone was going through, if someone was training full body resistance five times per week and 
we're starting at the top where it's like, okay, what is my bias here? Um, if someone's training full body resistance five times per week, I would think there's a reason why they're doing that. So if, if you're laying a program out and you're like, okay, training full body resistance five times a week and my bias is balance, really think to yourself, should they be training full body resistance five times per week, right? If we just need a balanced training program, maybe we need to do aerobics a couple of times a week, or maybe we just need to go for walks and still do resistance training three times a week. So I'm just throwing out a bunch of best practices, but uh, best practice, if, if, you're, if your bias is balanced, don't do full body resistance five times per week. Um, so again, thought experiment, if, if, uh, if you're training five times per week, you should have a bias. So let's say, for example, uh, your bias is the push pattern for whatever reason, right? Your bias is the push pattern. Go through the same process where you lay out what are my compounds in each of these five days? What patterns am I doing on each one of these five days? And count them up, right? If you have, if you have yourself doing uh, 12 sets throughout the week of squat and you have yourself doing 12 sets of push and 12 sets of everything else except for pull and you said your bias was going to be the push, it's like, that's just, that's a, that's a nice like self-assessment of like, okay, am I doing what I said I was going to do? go back in and make those adjustments. So I would just go through the same practice, no matter how many days per week I was training. As you start to talk about this, like idea of biasing, biasing certain patterns and uh, like manipulating that in that split, Carl, like the thing that comes to mind is that this is where like individualization really sits or personalization really sits because like, let's be real when it comes to putting together a full body resistance training split, or even an upper lower training split or a specific training split, like, a computer could do that. Uh, it's not that hard to like, just, as you said, have like 20 to 25 different templates and based on like, okay, this person's a beginner. Uh, they have this many days to train. This is the training split they're getting. This person's advanced. They have this many days to train. This is the training split that they're getting. Yeah. What that doesn't take into account is what you've just begun to lay out, which is, okay, we are biasing the pull pattern because we took them through assessment and we looked at their structural balance if they're pushing their pull pattern. And it turns out that their close grip bench press relative to their dumbbell external rotation and uh, power raise is uh, really high. We need to bring up the pull numbers. So what we're going to do is focus on pull work in this uh, next, you know, eight week uh, training cycle, eight week short-term plan. And I'm going to make sure I do that by having pull on these three days and reducing push volume throughout the week. So it's just really where the art of coaching comes in and where you do get to have a lot of fun uh, as a coach. You do really get to begin to connect that client to the importance of their individual capabilities, what you've seen in their assessment, and then what they're going to be doing in that program design. Everything else, it's pretty simple, but this is, uh, this is where you get to be a little, a little bit more fancy. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's funny that you said that, cause I just, uh, I'm working with, uh, with a girl that is having some herniation stuff uh, some like minor disc stuff going on and it's, it's pissed off when she squats. Right. So uh, the, the, the split that we laid out actually just uh, this morning was a, a lunge bias split where it was like, okay, we, we want to really hone in on the lunge um, to take some of that uh, pressure off the disc uh, that she was experiencing just experiencing just from the bilateral squatting. So um, yeah, it's always, that's, that's such a good point uh, from an individual uh, standpoint, not every, not every program is going to be completely balanced. Even if it is three times per week, there's some individual considerations that we need to keep in mind. Uh, for instance, if someone needs to bring something up because you notice that they're completely out of balance, um, and you need to give them an out of balance program to bring them back to balance. Um, so yeah, that's a really good point. Absolutely. All right. What's next? Any, any other examples you want to share? Um, we can hit upper lower. Yeah. Yeah. It's hit upper lower. So, um, yeah, upper lower, this one gets, this one gets a little weird. Uh, when, when we talk about giving this to someone that's training three times per week, uh, it doesn't get weird. Just gets a little bit different. We have to think outside the box a little bit. Um, and as I went through this, uh, cause I've, I've used splits in the past a lot 
that weren't, that had nothing to do with the days of the week. They're just like, this is day one, this is day two, this is day three. And it's just like rotating every day that they train. It just goes to the next day. Um, and I was, as I was putting this idea together, I'm like, fuck, we need to have this in coach RX. Cause right now all we have is uh, calendar based splits where it's just like days of the week. So uh, just be on the lookout of a day one, day two, day three, day four, like a rotating split going in as a feature um, because that's, uh, that's definitely needed. And it was really obvious as I was putting this one together, but uh, upper lower split. So if someone's training three times per week, think about what you're going to do there. Um, a lot of coaches that uh, really love the idea of just sticking to that calendar based approach because their clients like, no, 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 no. Like, I don't want to be squatting on a Tuesday one week and then pushing on a Tuesday the next week. I like, I want to build that rhythm. So what I recommend for uh, a lot of coaches is just go up or lower day one, day two, and then go full body on that third day. Um, and just ensure that you're biasing and compounds on that full body day, whatever that client needs. So that could be upper day one, lower day two, full body day three, uh, recycle week by week. Uh, but also consider the rotating split where you have day one, day two, day three, day four. So that would be upper, lower, upper, lower. So you'd have uh, upper day one, lower day one, upper day two, lower day two. You lay out those splits and they're just on a rotating basis. So if someone's training three days per week, Monday is upper one. Wednesday is lower one. Friday is upper two. Monday is lower two. And it just kind of cyclically goes. And then once you, uh, once you complete six sessions of each or whatever, however long your cycle is, then you reset the cycle. Um, so I would start there. If you have someone that's easy and you're like, uh, oh, I train four days per week. It's like, okay, you fit perfectly in this. Well, I train four days per week and I want to use the calendar split. They, they fit perfect in this, but also this plays for the, uh, upper one, lower one, upper two, lower two. So an idea here is day one upper. This one's really easy, right? It's push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, right? And, and we, we, we promised that we weren't, we weren't going to get specific in this, but we have to a little bit here. So just think about the variations of pushing and pulling, right? You can have vertical, you can have horizontal, you can focus on the scaps, um, you can use elbow flexion, you can use elbow extension, right? So we're almost using patterns, but we actually mean specific muscles when we start to say flexion and extension. Um, for most people, I would just keep it really simple though, uh, cause there's nothing wrong with just going push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, and just kind of making it whatever you want it to be. Right. Uh, day two would be lower. So an example of lower, and this is with core would be a one, a two is squat and core superset it. And then B one and B two would be bend and core superset it. And then C one and C two would be lunge and core superset it. Okay. So that would be upper day one and lower day one upper day two would be the same thing, right? So it would be the push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, and think about in your compounds, flipping those, right? So if you were specific and you said, okay, on day one, I'm pushing horizontally and I'm pulling horizontally in my compounds. And then my other push, pull, push, pull, push, they're more ISO. Um, then flip that on day three and go vertical, vertical. So horizontal or push, push vertical, pull vertical. And those are going to be your compounds. And then your ISOs are the others, if that makes sense. Um, so that would be push day two. And then, uh, or sorry, that would be upper day two. And then on lower day two, it would be the same format and you would just think about the same things, right? So instead of going, uh, instead of going squat and core, uh, because squat would be that compound movement, think about going bend and core. So it's just how you're ordering it and what's compound and what's not. And this isn't to say that every program has to have compound and, and isolated movements. You can give someone a program with all compounds and you can give someone a program with all ISOs. Uh, just depends on who they are and what their goals are and what their, where their capabilities sit. So that's an example of an upper one, upper, upper one, lower one, upper two, lower two split.
Now I've noticed that uh, for both the full body and then for the upper lower split as well, Carl, it's all been supersets, right? Like you haven't had mm-hmm. any straight sets. It's always been A1, A2, B1, B2. Uh, is that best practice or can you have variation inside of sets? Yeah, you could definitely have variation. I would, uh, if if the goal is to do fitness for life, I would always use, I would always use supersets because it's just more efficient. Um, if the goal is to get as good as we can at something, then I would think about using straight sets because you want to be hyper-focused on getting as good at that thing as possible. So you might even have in a fitness for life scenario, you might have someone that you're re you really need to hone in on their squat pattern. Like you really, like that is the outcome. That's the goal. Like that's, that's why they're with you. You may want to think about that squat pattern being a right. And then they're just like rest walking between sets. Like you don't even want them pulling or doing core or doing anything else. It's like, I want you to do the squat pattern, but if you're just kind of dosing them and just kind of giving them exposure, I just, I always love the idea of supersets. Um, And, you know, we could lay out supersets in a smart way where, you know, we can really focus on one pattern without interrupting that pattern by, by choosing um, a, an opposing muscle group or an opposing pattern, kind of like what we're talking about with the bend and the pull. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, so that is our upper lower. And it's funny, as you were talking about the like rotating split, I haven't thought about that, like structure of uh, training in such a long time. But when I first like got into lifting weights, that's what it was. It was like an AB, AB or ABC. And, uh, you just like showed up to the gym and like did the day that that was up uh, on your piece of paper uh, and it wasn't tied to a day of the week. I haven't thought about training in that way in such a long time um, just because like, you know, going through in the world that we're in and the use of tech uh, and the way that like most platforms are built, it's not like that. It is based off a calendar view, but um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of people that operate like that still. So yeah, we're going to, I haven't seen, technology that that utilizes that um i'm sure it exists but i just haven't seen it yeah so so in my mind we're going to be innovators in technology by going back to the basics there we go <laughs> love it um cool so that that's upper lower anything else to add there before we move on to specific uh no unless not unless you have anything to add. No, all good. So let's uh let's roll into that specific split and an example of what that might look like yeah, so I'm actually not going to spend that much time on this because I think it's pretty clear, right? Like you're going in and you're choosing a pattern and you're doing that pattern. The only thing that I would consider here is if you are doing those compounds, it's even more important to put those compounds up front. Um, and I know there's a lot of methods out there where it's like, oh, we're going to do this pre-fatigue and then we're going to go. It's like, come the fuck on. Like just if you're going to do a compound movement, just get after it and do compound movements like don't pre-fatigue yourself and then try to, you know, hit heavy back squats. Um, so with that being said, obviously, you know, my thoughts there, but with that, with that being said, um, I think it's really important that we do go compound to ISO, um, from A to C or A to D. I think that's really important. Um, another consideration is how many days per week you're training. Like I, I hate this split for anyone that's not training five, six days a week. And I hate and I'd hate for someone to train resistance specifically five to six days a week. So I guess I don't love this split. Um, I just don't think it's very balanced. I think this is a, I think this is a solid split. If someone needs to uh, hyper-focus on some specific patterns for an amount of time, Um, you know, so for example, I love this to, I love this as like a blended split and we haven't laid that out, but uh, just imagine someone that's doing like uh, a combination of full body resistance and a specific split, right? So that could look like FBR day one, uh, day two, they're just doing uh, the push pattern specifically. And then day three, they're doing FBR. And then day four, they're doing the bend pattern specifically because they really need to improve their push or their bend pattern. I, I like it in that scenario. Um but now we're going back to like, why the hell do they really need those patterns? And can they not get them from full body or upper lower? Uh, I'm sure there's some scenarios where that is the case, but I think that's like the 1%. So not a huge, huge fan of, uh, or a proponent of, of giving this split, but I do, I think it's interesting when people experience it. Um, I've given this to a couple of coaches just to experience it. And, uh, 
it, it lets you know who's able to express those patterns fully and not, right? Like, cause if for someone that can express these patterns fully and you're giving them some really high volume ISOs and you're giving them some really, uh, well, not really, some intense compounds, it's like, these are very, very fatiguing days. Yeah, definitely. It's like one of those things where it's like, why, like, why do we have it in education for advanced if we're not prescribing it all the time, but it's important to know that it does exist and it is an option there for that person that is at that like 1% who is capable of expressing it, or that you can then take this like very pure idea of a specific split or isolated split and then blend it with some of the other methodologies. So I think we have to um, keep in mind that we have these principles laid out and then the, again, I come back to this, like the art of coaching, but the art of coaching is in the implementation and you making the decision uh, and you having the thought process as to like, what, am I going to follow this to a T and do exactly what the textbook says? Or am I going to understand the principle behind it and why we might choose to train a specific pattern on a specific day and go very deep down the rabbit hole of expressing that? Uh, and then be able to blend that with, again, some more balance work or some full body resistance on other days uh, for the person that doesn't need that five or six days a week. Yeah. And the reality is there isn't a lot of advanced trainees out there. Yeah, very true. You know, so yeah, those are, those are the splits. Um, yeah, I don't know. Was that a whole enough conversation? Did we I, miss anything there? I I don't think so. I think we like went pretty, uh, I think we had a pretty good conversation on splits if I uh, do say so myself. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that who a, I am that to say a, that. That was a damn good conversation, I must yeah. say. No, I, I mean, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think that uh, I, I don't have any like thing to wrap up on. I feel like we're, we're pretty solid there, Carl. Yeah, I think uh, just some final thoughts that kind of ran across my brain as we went through that was um just like goals of uh training splits right uh from a coach's standpoint i think we want to keep it as simple as possible um i think we want to ensure that it's sustainable the split that we're laying out allows for sustainability and resistance training to occur um we need to go from big picture to to smaller picture or long term to short term and I think we need to consider what's going on outside of the gym as well. Um, and I know that kind of reflects the, the uh, ensuring that it's sustainable, but I think that's something that we need to think about too. Definitely. And then like one last thing that comes to mind as a, I don't want to call it a sticking point in designing splits for me personally, but something that I'm conscious of is that it can be tempting to think you have to reinvent the wheel with that split every single cycle. So when you sit down to design a new short-term cycle and you're putting in the split in place, you look at the one from the, the you know, eight weeks prior and you're like, well, I kind of just want to keep doing the same thing. Like this is appropriate for this person. Obviously there's going to be shifts in the map work they're doing and exactly what's going into exercise selection and our reps and sets are going to change because we're in accumulation and now we're in intensification, but I actually want to stick with the same training split and just work inside of that. It's okay to do that. <laughs> like you don't have mm -hmm. to be changing a split every single cycle. Yes. There may be a time where it's appropriate to shift up that split. Uh, so if you need to do it, but be okay with uh, keeping things the same also if you don't have a good reason to change it. Yeah, agreed. Cool. Well, uh, I want to just make sure everyone knows that we have a CCP cohort that we're currently enrolling for. Uh, so if you want to go deep down the rabbit hole of splits and have conversations uh, in greater depth, actually have some of my hands on practice and putting this stuff together. And that includes all of the work that goes prior to putting together a split, right? Like we're not just teaching splits in CCP. You've got to do the preliminary work of gathering assessment data. You've got to understand periodization, laying out the long-term and the short-term plan before that. And then all the fun program design stuff that happens after. Uh, we do have that cohort enrolling. So if you're interested in joining, I'll make sure that there's a link in the description to be able to go ahead and uh, get some more information about joining us in CCP. Yeah, join us. Come on board. We'd love to have you. All right, guys. Well, uh, have a good one and uh, we'll see you next week. See you guys.